everybody. We're at uh, my daughter's ranch, Becky, Hello. and this is a Thursday meeting. Uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to, uh, sometimes I just kind of talk off the cuff, but I thought uh, last night I just began reading, starting the book of Acts. I finished Revelation, made some comments on it, and I got a couple of studies I'm doing, Galatians and all, but I thought, oh, maybe I'll start the book of Acts being I read the, started reading it last night. So we'll start the book of Acts, and I wrote a commentary on the book of Acts years ago, so what I'll do is I'll just make the videos, I might do some new writing when you all see these on the posts I upload, uh, but I'll probably just also post that old commentary. I don't believe I taught it when I did the radio. I probably, when I was doing radio, I, tr I maybe briefly covered it. So some studies that you see on my website, they're old commentaries I wrote, as well as, oh, the door is open. They're old commentaries I wrote, and also, like, videos that I'm adding along. So I think I left the door open, so I'm going to get in trouble. So we're going to start Acts chapter 1. And what we'll, what we'll cover in Acts is the history of what happened after Jesus did his ministry, which we read about in the Gospels, and he died, was buried, and then rose again. And a few weeks ago, when I was at my other daughter's house, Bethany, she asked about, and what happened um, later? And I said, well, Jesus ascended into heaven. And she didn't, she didn't remember that, or she didn't know that. I said, no, I said, we read in the Bible that after Jesus started the movement and he did all the teaching, the parables and stuff, he died, was buried, rose again, and then ascended into heaven. We read about that event in Acts chapter 1. And I'll just kind of overview it real quick. And what we'll see in this book is the history of the Christian movement. Over the years, uh, I've had friends that, you know, sincere people that used to ask me, how do you know the Bible is not just made up? Like, how do we know, John, that there are a lot of other religious books? There are different ways that we can uh, show that the Bible is not made up. One of the most important books that you use when you debate within the field of people that debate these things is the book of Acts. And you say, well, how does the book of Acts... How can this book, which is really the church history book of the New Testament, written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, and how could this book kind of be used to prove that the Bible is not fake? In the history of time, there are many fields of study that human beings developed. Okay? Two particular ones, archaeology, how did archaeology really develop? Now, if I'm remembering right, I've covered the whole history of a lot of things. Archaeology developed after we had what we refer to as the industrial revolutions, meaning England and, of course, America and nations, they started realizing, oh, the great uh, breakthroughs the last 400 years, 300 years, and the great breakthroughs of how manufacturing is going to start and how we're going to have machinery and all these types of things, industry. Okay, this is a great thing. And what we began doing is digging into the ground because we needed to get the precious metals and the materials that you use for industry. And as a result of man's endeavor, the advancement of man, the enlightenment, we found things under the ground. <laughs> That's how the field of archaeology developed. I read that years ago, taught it. So I don't have any real deep, quick references. But either way, when we began digging under the ground, when we found certain items from past civilizations, from past people groups, from past history, then we began to verify, wait a minute, uh, uh, Becky or somebody told me there used to be uh, an oil field in Alice. But Alice has changed its... 500 years now in the future and there's nothing in Alice we just see now trees and bushes and a vacant pool that nobody used 
And so we began digging in Alice to maybe start a farm or something. And all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, I found some oil tools. I found an old oil rig that's buried. Okay, well, Becky was telling the truth. That's what archaeology did for the Bible, because you began unearthing stories that were written in the Bible and then saying, wait a minute, there's this piece of um, money which was described or this particular area or city or pottery, that's what we began doing. Archaeology actually became a field where we could verify what we say is the veracity of Scripture, at least from the historical perspective. Why is the book of Acts one of the big books that we use? Okay, in the book of Acts, as I go through it over the next couple of months, you have a lot of court proceedings. The Apostle Paul is going to be held at courts, and he's going to say, you've got to appeal to a certain magistrate, a certain this one and that one. And we read in the book of Acts about all of these incidents. Well, later on, along with the field of archaeology, there was another field that developed what was called uh, documentary evidence. Okay, this is not just for the Bible. This is for anything. Uh, the works of Homer, okay, about 800 years before the time of Christ. Oh, I forget, what is it, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay, now I'm quoting. Uh, but you have ancient writings that we began looking at and saying, okay, let's see if these are, docu if these are accurate. What about the writings we, uh, uh, Aristotle, Plato, uh, the, his students wrote about him, things like that. Well, when you come to the book of Acts, there was a man by the name of Sir Ramsey. Sir Ramsey began applying the field of documentary evidence, which was another new science that was a field of, that was just, uh, understood that we began going back and researching ancient writings. And when Sir Ramsey began doing that to the book of Acts and the New Testament, he began as a skeptic. Okay, this is, uh, well, somewhere around the turn of the last century, you could say, right around the 1900s. And Sir Ramsey said, I'm going to do as best as I can and go back to any other documents historians wrote back in the time of Jesus, and we're going to see. Rome was a real literal empire, the Roman Empire. It's not fake. And so he said, let's see. Let's check out the book of Acts all these little courts and judges and these streets that are mentioned. He said when he was done, and he began as a skeptic, thinking, we're going to show that it's not true. When he was done, he concluded that the book of Acts was the most reliable historical document than any that dated back to that time, 2,000 years ago. And so he changed his viewpoint, and he simply looked at some of the historical things in the book of Acts, so, as we read the book of Acts, we're going to read things that you cannot prove historically. This Holy Spirit's going to come on the church. Now, we have witnesses that witness of that in the book of Acts. We, we, historically, we argue for the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. And in the first chapter of Acts, we're going to read about how Jesus showed himself alive after he was crucified, and we read there are above or about 500 witnesses that witness Jesus. Now these are testimonies from real people in a historical document. And of course the skeptics could say, well maybe people lied and so forth. We obviously don't believe that people lied, but it shows you it's just not stories, okay? As man advanced in his knowledge and the fields that I just discussed, we were able to go back and do things like I just explained. So Axes uh, one of the best for that because it's the history book. Now let me just cover the chapter real quick. After Jesus had his ministry with his men, did all the teaching we read about in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he tells them, and this is what you read in the first chapter, that some of the disciples we read after the resurrection, Peter, he went out fishing one day. It almost seemed like after Jesus did all the things he did, they still lacked a true vision of what they were supposed to do. Okay, Jesus was among us. He was crucified. These are the disciples. I'm putting these thoughts in their minds. 
And then he rose again. And then they're walking around thinking, what's next? They didn't have the full understanding of everything. In Acts 1, we read that Jesus told them, I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. Now we read the quote in Acts 1, because I just read it. The quote in Acts 1 is the one we read from John the Baptist, but it is also attributed to Jesus because the words are in red. Um, John ba will baptize you with water, but Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, the disciples knew that there was coming a special event which you could call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit would come to the church. Jesus speaks a lot about that in John's Gospel. He says, it is expedient for you, it's necessary for you believers, that I go away. If I do not go away, the Holy Spirit, or the Comforter, will not come. Jesus is, these are the words I'm quoting of Jesus in John's Gospel. But if I go, I will send the promise of the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he will come, and he's going to teach you everything, he's going to show you everything. So in chapter 1 of Acts, they have the, the commission, wait for the promise of the Father at the city of Jerusalem. That was the message. It says in Acts 1, Jesus gave them commandments by the Holy Spirit of things that they were supposed to do. So, they were supposed to wait. They're going to go to Jerusalem. We're not going to read the great event. I'm not going to do it on chapter 1. We're going to do it in chapter 2. But that's the word. You guys wait. Okay. Now, what happened right at the end of the ministry of Jesus, at the end of the gospel? We have all that I covered when I taught John's gospel. But one of the disciples commits suicide. That was Judas. So Peter, in the chapter we're covering, chapter 1, Peter is now trying to say, what's the next step? And Peter begins, have, begins having insight, we're going to see this all through the book of Acts, from the Old Testament book of Psalms, and the things that David, who wrote the Psalms, most of them, was saying. And so Peter then stands up with all the men. They're told to go away to Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. They're not sure what's going to happen. They, Jesus just told them to wait. He was with them. And they see him ascend into heaven. And this is Acts 1. And they're standing there looking up. And there are two men or angels in white apparel that appear. And say, why are you standing here looking up into heaven? The same Jesus that was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. They're waiting. He's gone. He promised the Spirit's coming. And then Peter decides... He's now going to be the leader of the, this group. He's the prominent figure in about the first half of the book of Acts. Some people refer to it as sort of the Acts of Peter. But then in the last half of Acts, Paul is the prominent figure. Paul is not even a Christian at this point. He gets converted later in Acts chapter 9. So Peter stands up and says this. One of our group of the twelve is dead. And he quotes the Psalms. He says, but it was written that that was going to happen. There were Psalms, the Old Testament Bible that Peter had and was learning, and it said, uh, a friend is going to rise up against me, my familiar friend, and we also have prophecies in Zechariah. Jesus was wounded in the house of his friends, and there's a specific psalm that Peter interprets and says, that was talking about Judas. Judas was preordained and the scripture teaches this, to be the betrayer of Jesus. So Peter says, there's another psalm, Psalms 109, and in that psalm it says, let another take his office. So what Peter does in Acts 1, he begins interpreting those two psalms. He says, therefore, that was talking about Judas. Someone else needs to replace his office. So Peter says, let's pick two men, that have been with us all along, that they too can be witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, and we're going to kind of do a vote. It says they cast lots, okay? And But God, who knows the hearts, he's going to show who's supposed to be the replacement for Judas. 
and they pick a man by the name of uh, Joseph, uh, uh, whose name is something like Barsabas, I think, and then a man by the name of Matthias. And then they do this kind of vote, but they leave it up to God, and Matthias is picked. This is chapter 1 of Acts. So, we have the replacement of Judas by a man by the name of Matthias, and you have all of the disciples, and there's about 120 at this point. The Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there. The women. And then we read that they were gathered together. A, a group of them were in the, the upper room. They were waiting. And they were all in prayer and in unity, waiting for the next thing that's going to happen. Now, when we do chapter 2, I won't do it now, but chapter 2 is a key chapter in the Bible because all of the early Christians... They've been with Jesus all the way up until the fulfillment of all that he said would happen. And until the Holy Spirit comes to the church, which is going to be next chapter, there's, there's nothing really happening. Because Jesus said, you will receive, it's famous verse, this is in Acts 1, you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me, both in Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit, the gift that Jesus spoke about and they're waiting for, he is going to come upon the church, the believers, and then the message is going to go. Then there's going to be a revolution that takes place, which is the founding of the church. What is very interesting about the few things I just covered about the history of it all, but anybody, I'm going through some old courses right now, but these are college courses that I ordered from uh, online called Great Courses. And the Great Courses are good. You can, it's not religious. It's, you can get teachers from Harvard teaching philosophy, teaching world history. And so those are the ones I order, the Western intellectual tradition. Everything that I go through, whenever you're studying the field of you, the history of humanity, some of the courses, when I get to certain parts, they're actually on CDs, and I go through them over the years. I mean, it's in the history of Christianity is embedded in every one of them. In the earlier days, when you had uh, the university and university system, the main fields were theology and philosophy. The study of God was the main field of study and then the study of philosophy. Later on, uh, we have other things that arose, but uh, when you study world history, anything you're going to get educated in, even when you study science, the cosmos, you cannot escape the history of Christians, uh, Christianity, Scripture plays a big role in it, but even outside of it, just the reality that many of Descartes the thinkers, the Rene Descartes, the famous thinkers, the famous scientists, the Copernican Revolution, Galileo. I mean, on and on and on, you don't escape it. And when I go through all these courses, and I'm going through another one now, the man is not a believer, because uh, I listen to the course, but as he's teaching, he's teaching Western intellectual tradition, just the understanding of the thinkers. But he has to go through that he's doing, he going through the Reformation, going through the history of Protestantism, and, because it's embedded. So what we're going to see in the book of Acts is how did all this happen? How did such a movement start in the first century, these followers of Jesus, and by the time Constantine rises to be the emperor, which is in the fourth century, Christianity becomes the official religion of the whole realm, the Roman Empire, which was the ruling empire at that time. How did it happen? Just from a historical viewpoint, it's an amazing thing. And we as Christians, we're going to see how that happened. So they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. And a few practical things when you study church history, uh, the Azusa Street Revivals, which is in the beginning of the 20th century, 1906-1907 uh, in California. It's great history there. That's kind of the history of the Pentecostals. Okay, And there was a great revival that took place in California at that time. There was a black man by the name of uh, Seymour, and God poured out the Spirit in a new way at that time. 
and they began the gift of tongues coming again in a new way, which we're going to read about in the next chapter. And it was a great movement. I used to teach, uh, I don't think I've taught it recently. And then some Christians have debated it. Wait a minute, is this tongues of the devil? Is this, well, I don't believe it is, obviously. But we're going to see how even this particular book, Book of Acts, the experiences that Christians have had with the outpouring in spirit, uh, began whole movements within Christianity. And eventually there's a famous, I'll do this one in the 1960s, there was a famous event within the Catholic Church called the Duca at Duquesne University, and there was also a baptism of the Spirit that took place within that university at that time in the late 60s, and then there was a debate. Many Catholics began speaking in tongues, and then the Church the Catholic Church itself had what's referred to as the Catholic Charismatic Movement. And then they had to decide, are we going to bless this movement of speaking in tongues that was breaking, taking place amongst many denominations? And the Church gave its, its official blessing upon the Charismatic Movement within the Catholic Church and the gift of tongues and the baptism of the Spirit. And you have entire denominations that arose just from the outpouring of the Spirit that took place in the beginning of the 20th century at Azusa. It's called the Azusa Street Revival. There was a great, there's a man by the name of Frank Bartleman. I read his books, and he uh, wrote at the time, and he was just giving an account of what was happening. And so, very interesting, the whole history of how this event of them waiting for the Holy Spirit 2,000 years ago, in the, we read about in the book of Acts, and there, it began a great movement and a great history. So we're going to be, we have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit, which is going to come in the next chapter, and then the Holy Spirit will empower that early church to go and preach under great persecution. First couple of centuries of the Christian movement, you had a lot of martyrs, you had a lot of uh, people that gave their lives for the faith, they tried to stamp out this new movement, referred to as the way in the book of Acts, they couldn't stop it. They started telling Peter and the others, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. They said, we will not. Peter says, should we obey God or man? It's, we're going to obey God. There's going to be a lot of miracles, we see. And all of these things still take place today. So that's where we're at. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. They replaced Judas with a man by the name of Matthias, and they're waiting. And then... Acts 2. I'll, I'll do only out here, I'll do the Acts study. That way, Becky, and when Lulu, Lulu's not feeling well today. And that way you guys won't miss it. I'll, I'm doing other studies uh, right now. So, that's Acts 1. Everybody read it. Read my commentary that I add. Becky, any questions? Nope. Can't wait for Acts 2. Okay, Acts 2 is going <laughs> to be the great breakthrough. We're going to read the great miracles. We're going to yeah. see the Holy Spirit when he comes to the church. It's going to be like they're all going to be, I won't do it, I'll save it. But it's going to be a great miracle. And what I want my Bible students to focus on is notice how the Apostle Peter is going to begin interpreting these Old Testament scriptures from Psalms. I gave you a couple in the first chapter. And Peter is just saying, because the Spirit is showing Peter, Paul does this later on in the book of Acts, but Peter says, that's what King David was prophesying about. I'm doing some of this in my Galatians study. Paul does the same thing. But the verses Peter used in this chapter of Acts 1 come from Psalms. And there was a psalm that said, let someone else take his office. And Peter says, David was prophesying about Judas. He would commit suicide. And if you did not believe scripture, meaning that we believe God was showing that to those apostles, just from the standpoint of being a literary critic, you would say, well, how does Peter know that was talking about Judas? Because God was showing them that, okay? So that's, uh, you'll look, hopefully we'll cover some of that. All right, let me pray at the end here. Father, I thank you for all of the friends and people that are uh, going to get to join with this Acts study. And I pray whenever they watch the video, uh, when these get uploaded, and even down the road, I pray that you would baptize everybody with the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit of God would come upon everybody that watches the videos, and that they would go forth and be witness 
that they would see that it's not just about us reading and learning, but that we have to be witnesses and we are dependent upon the Holy Spirit. So I ask for the Spirit of God to come on everybody that watches this video. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.